All right, we are live. I hope you all had a great weekend and thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be looking at who the real Jesus is. Islam makes its own claims about who Jesus is. And of course, there's the Christian claim of who Jesus is, and then there's various other claims as well. We're going to take a look at this from a couple different angles, theologically, historically, and so on. And we're going to draw some conclusions by looking at the data and determine who the real Jesus really was. I'm joined today by Ask Truth Apologetics. Uh, a link to his channel is in the description. I definitely recommend checking that out. He does a lot of uh, Christian apologetics with a focus on outreach to Islam, so very similar to my channel. And he also... <laughs> Cat, the cat's going crazy on me. <laughs> <laughs> he also does some very humorous material, so I definitely recommend checking that out. I'll give him a chance to give a more thorough introduction for himself here in a second, but first let's open with a word of prayer if the cat allows it. <laughs> uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with fellow believers and sometimes unbelievers from all around the world. We ask that you be with us today, that you guide our discussion and prevent us from theological error. We ask that those who are watching, whether they are Christians, Muslim, or otherwise, approach the material with an open mind, that they sim don't simply dismiss what we have to say without listening. We ask all this Amen. I think we lost a uh, voice, at least maybe I did on my end. I think, what are the cats? Uh, you look like you're muted, buddy. Yeah, the cat uh, jumped on your on your keyboard and hit the correct buttons is what I decided <laughs> happened. Yeah. Can you hear me now, though? I can hear you loud and clear. I awesome. assume the audience can as well. So Yeah, so the... Cat was going a little crazy there, and then he decided to leave. But I guess on his way out, he, <laughs> he bumped the, the microphone and turned it off. But it's all good. We're back now. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and tell us a little about, bit about what you're doing? Yeah, I'm going to keep it brief. People don't care that much. Uh, people know how YouTube works. Go to, my, go to the link. See if you like my stuff. If you do, like, subscribe, share, hit notifications, all those fun things. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, I'm just a guy who, who loves Jesus. Uh, and I love ministering to people who are interested in learning about Jesus. Um, and so, you know, you just get what you get. All right. Sounds good. I'll go ahead and put the presentation up on the screen. Perfect. So um, just as a, as a preface to everyone, I was supposed to be in charge of the presentation. I designed it and everything. But for whatever reason, uh, my browser won't let me share. So I had to... Uh, give it to Thaddeus here. And so he will be going through it. He has a very um, difficult task ahead. So Thaddeus, I do apologize in advance for all of the hard work I'm going to force you to do. Uh, but otherwise, uh, this is a very important question. Um, and this actually is a, is a question that Jesus posed to his followers. And he asked them, you know, who do you say that I am. And there are a lot of different answers that we get this right. Because as we all know, Jesus is literally the most famous person in the entire world. He is the most revered, and yet he is still also the most misunderstood person in the world. And almost nobody describes Jesus in the same exact way. We all kind of have a tendency of transforming Jesus and morphing him into our own image into our own ideology and theology. So Christians have Jesus described in the New Testament. The Gnostics have Jesus described um, in their Gospels. Yeah, there you go. See, you got it, buddy. Um, the Jews have Jesus described in their commentaries. The Quran has Jesus described in their Hadith. The Hindus have Jesus as being one of the incarnations of Krishna. And the Buddhists believe that someone that Jesus was someone who, like Buddha, had attained some kind of enlightenment. Now, the pagans, of course, transformed their own mythology into resembling Jesus um, 
from the Bible and the Mormons, as we are kind of aware of, have Jesus as some kind of Messiah and God of this world, but you can also be a God of the next world, whereas the New Agers have a term of enlightenment coined Christ consciousness. So with all those varying ideas of who Jesus is, how do we go about discovering who the actual Jesus is? So if you could just go forward a couple more, okay. there's your Hindu one, there's your Buddha one. I think the next one's your um, Mormon one, and this is your New Age one. Yep. So here's what we're going to cover today, guys. We're going to cover three main discussion points on how can we uncover who the person of Jesus Christ is, right? So we can look at this from a theological perspective. We can look at it through uh, linguistics or semantics language. And we are going to look at this historically as well. And we're going to pull all three of these paths together. And I'm going to try to make it as concise as possible while maintaining as much knowledge uh, and, and information as we can possibly need. All right. So theologically, let's go to the next slide, please. Jesus asked us this very important question. And he says, who do you say that I am? And honestly, the answer to this question is a matter of life and death. It's a matter of salvation versus condemnation or heaven and hell. So seriously, we need to consider this, not from what our parents said, what our imam said, what our pastor said, what the cool hippie looking dude on YouTube said, what your yoga instructor said. I want you to think about this from a holistic perspective, and I'm going to present to you the Christian case for Christ. Uh, but first, Thaddeus, I'll have you click that theological button. Oh. So if you just go back, click on, there should be a link. There you go. Um, if you're able to follow the link, please do. If not, I can read the Bible otherwise. Um, so basically where it's going to take you, if it takes you there, is it's going to, there you go. Uh, that is not the link. That's funny. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that was the very last link that I placed on anything. Um, go figure. And maybe it just overrode everything. Anyhow, um, let me try it from my end here real quick. So we, we're just all on the same page. I want to see if it totally messed up or if it's just a weird thing. Uh, give me two seconds here, guys. And uh, Thaddeus, while I'm stalling here, if anybody has any questions, um, let me let me know that. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Let's see here. Theologically. Uh, we actually we have a great question here. Okay. Yeah. Even though it's, even though it's from the infamous Jason Bourne. Uh, oh, so Jason Bourne or thirteen <laughs> other people. Yes. Uh, what method and criteria do you use for history? Uh, I'm much that. Um, so that's a really good question. If I don't answer that question uh, throughout this presentation, Jason, please uh, re-ask that question. We'll make sure that we uh, address address your particular question. So thank you. Um, yeah, it's apparently not working, but luckily I've got notes. So this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Okay, so that is essentially the Christian uh, theology of the outline of who Jesus is. So let's dive into the theology first, because fulfilled prophecy is a powerful way of demonstrating the truthfulness of the Bible. Um, <laughs> we're going to try these slides out. So uh, all, we're, we're going to look at Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, Micah 5, Zechariah 9, well, It does Daniel appear 7. that these ones will work. Hey, sweet. Maybe I just made a stupid, stupid mistake here. <laughs> all right. I do this from time to time. So anyhow. Um, all right. 
So we're going to go into Psalm 22, <laughs> verse 6 through, I believe, verse 18. Okay. And let me close one of these things out here. And then we're going to kind of exegete this just a little <laughs> bit to show how, if you guys are aware of the life and teachings of Jesus, how Psalm 22 describes him prophetically, right? This was a Psalm written by David thousand years before the birth of Christ. Um, the Psalm starts out with my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is exactly what Jesus said when he was on the cross. And the entire Psalm itself paints the picture of the passion of Christ up through the crucifixion and into the resurrection. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to get in to that too far. But this is where it starts out at verse six. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people, right? Which is clearly depicted by Jesus. All who see me mock me and they make mouths at me and they wag their heads. Clearly depicted of Jesus, of this happening to him on his way to the cross or on the cross. He trusts in the Lord, they say, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him from, for he delights in him, which is exactly what people were mocking and saying to Jesus while he was on the cross. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at your mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to hope. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me, which uh, is imagery for large, fierce enemies, i.e. the Romans. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and uh, roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. And I want to remind you guys of the crucifixion of Jesus, right? So um, in the Gospel of John, he, his side is pierced and blood and water come out. I am poured out like water, like blood. Okay, all of my bones are out of joints. So when someone is being crucified, their joints start to come out of place. And their heart is like wax again when he was pierced by the spirit beer, that waxy substance, blood mixed with water come out and was melted in his breast. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaw. As Jesus says on the cross, I thirst. You lay me in the dust of death for dogs encompass me, right? So dogs are non-Israelites. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, again, because he's hung up and displayed. They stare and gloat over me, which is clearly depicted in the Gospels. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots, which is exactly what happened in the Gospels, right? So we're talking theologically, we're talking fulfilled prophecy here in Isaiah, or sorry, not Isaiah, but Psalm 22. Um, does he, do you, Thaddeus, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I'd just add a, a couple words that um, you, you can you can try this experiment. You, you can mm -hmm. read this passage out to someone who is not necessarily a believer, but is at least familiar with who yeah. Jesus is and ask them, you know, what am I, am I reading here? And there's a good chance that they'll, they'll guess that this is Jesus. Um, the second thing I would add is, you know, we're not going to get through the whole psalm, but definitely check that out. It has it ends with a prophecy of mm -hmm. the death of this person somehow mm -hmm. bringing all the nations to know God, mm -hmm. to know uh, Yahweh from the Old Testament. Absolutely, no, for sure. And I, I've I'm going to be long winded here, guys, and I'm trying to make it as short as possible. But if if I were to go through every single fulfilled prophecy of Jesus, we'd be here for a few days going straight through it. So I just want to try to give you guys enough information to, to get you excited about it and then to make you go do what you're supposed to do and read it and search the gospels and search the scriptures yourself. So hopefully you guys will continue to do that. All right, moving on to Isaiah 53. So that'll be the next tab. Maybe it'll come up. Maybe it won't. Okay. So I, Isaiah 53 really starts in Isaiah 52, um, verse 12, 
and uh, it goes all the way through Isaiah 53. Again, I'm not going to read every single verse, but I'm going to I'm going to read quite a few of these verses here, starting with verse three. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, as acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him as he has put him to grief. When his soul maketh an offering or makes an offering for guilt. So that's as far as I'm going to take it there. Um, if you just go into a fairly ignorant audience and you read this passage, don't tell them where it's from. Most people think it's from the Gospels. It's such a clear prophecy of Jesus that I, if I were to sit there and kind of do what I did with Psalm 22 and tell you every little detail about what's going on and how it mimics it, we'd be here a while as well. But I'll, I'll let Thaddeus, um, if you want to add a little bit of comments to that as well, brother, please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that would be my first comment, that, that if you read this, someone, they're going to say it's about Jesus. And if you look at the quote-unquote official uh, position of the modern Jewish um, faith, mm -hmm. they'll say it's about the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. Yet, nonetheless, uh, when you look at the Jewish position throughout history, you can see Jewish rabbi after Jewish rabbi after Jewish rabbi um, before the time of Jesus, during the time of Jesus, after the time of Jesus, saying that this is a prophecy of the Messiah, uh, of the Savior of the world. And only in relatively recent times has this interpretation that it's not about an individual, that it's somehow about the nation as a whole Correct. has become official. And even then, uh, a survey of people living in Israel. Um, so, you know, in theory, the most dev devout Jewish people on the planet, it, it's like 50-50, like 50% of the public thinks it's about Jesus, even though that's not the, the correct <laughs> official even though interpretation. He, they, they might not be accepting him as their Messiah, right? Right. Um, no, I think it's a great point. But again, guys, this is illustrating that the, the life and teachings of Jesus and the most well-known fact of, of his life, which is his crucifixion, was no random accident. This was, this was planned from the very beginning. There are so many verses we could get into, um, but we're going we're gonna to go ahead and just keep moving on to Isaiah 7, and then pretty quickly we'll get to Isaiah 9, right? So, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Now, Thaddeus, I'm pretty sure you know this. What does Emmanuel mean? <laughs> that would mean God with us. God with us. What a weird theological name for someone to have, like Jesus, who's called Emmanuel uh, in the Gospel of Matthew uh, during his, his birth narrative. Uh, we'll just move on to Isaiah uh, uh, chapter 9. Yeah, go ahead. I, th say. I think it'd be worth to say a, a quick word here that we get this charge all the time that uh, virgin is not the correct translation mm -hmm. of this word, that it should be young woman. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look, however, and, and carefully study the usage of the, the two different terms in the Old Testament, you'll see that this uh, of the two Hebrew terms that could have potentially been used to describe a young woman, this is the one that is much more closely associated with virginity as we think of it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll additionally just say that it's kind of just 
presupposed that a young unmarried woman is going to be a virgin. So it, it, there isn't exactly a technical right. term for it in ancient mm -hmm. Hebrew because it's kind of just automatically assumed. But we can right. assume that that the people who were reading this before Jesus's time and translated it into Greek knew what they were talking about. They mm -hmm. understood the language. We can assume that Matthew, who independently translates it, does not actually use the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation, despite I see people make that claim that he mm -hmm. inherited the air. But actually, he's an independent witness as to its meaning. Right. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, I, we we could discuss that all day long. We'll just, we'll just yeah, I, I think that's second. sufficient. I just wanted to put that out there so that we we are aware of, of we that are thing. aware. <laughs> yep, exactly. So Isaiah nine here as well. Um, let me see if I actually have it pulled up larger. I do. So we're going to begin in verse two. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, who dwelt in a land of deep darkness. On them has light shone. Is is Jesus? Does Jesus ever say he's he's light, the light of the world, or anything like that? How does how does this work? That is. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think he ever made that claim. Anyway. <laughs> I feel like if I just read the first uh, couple of verses of uh, the Gospel of John, the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Something like that. Anyhow, uh, you have multiplied the nation; you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest as they are glad with they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian for every boot on the trampling warrior is battle uh, tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the lord of hosts will do this uh thaddeus you want to give us a uh quick or brief uh exegesis of this uh, well, yeah. So Isaiah, you know, introduced this figure in chapter seven, and now mm -hmm. he's bringing them back up, uh, expounding upon it some more here. And he he gives us a number of descriptions of this figure that he's predicting. Um, but of course, the most important aspect is of these four names that he gives in mm -hmm. one, uh, verse six: Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Four titles that can only properly be attributed to God, yet he is attributing these to, in theory, a human being who has been born of a virgin. Bingo. Perfect. All right. Moving on to Micah 5. Once you get there, I will. Man, we're not. Nobody's given us a whole bunch of questions here yet, but uh, you guys are welcome to. I'm trying to pay attention to the comment section here. Uh, so Micah 5, but you, O Bethlehem, <coughs> as I choke on my own, yep. Uh, you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to become the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth for me, one who will be the ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from old and from ancient days. <coughs> Excuse me. So what, what's, what's the prophecy here? It's uh, that the Messiah, right, the leader of Judah, will come forth from the ancient days, and he will come forth from where? Where's, where's his birthplace, Thaddeus? Uh, it? it goes to be Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Um, was Jesus uh, from, from Beth? Was he born in Bethlehem? Uh, according to the Gospels, he was. According to the Gospels, he was. All right. Fulfilling prophecy. We got two more prophecies here, folks. I'm trying not to bore you to death. Zechariah 9. Uh, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. Uh, does this remind you of any any scenes from Jesus' life, Thaddeus? Yeah, this would remind me of the last week of his life. Hmm. Well, did did he was he a humble humble fella? Indeed, he was. Did he come to give us salvation? 
He did. Did he ride into Jerusalem on a donkey? Indeed. Hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Daniel 7. Uh, uh, once we get this pulled up, if you don't already, I saw in the night visions, starting at verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. Now, Thaddeus, do you know how many times uh, Yahweh is called uh, the cloud rider? I don't have an exact number, but it's fairly frequent. It's like 70-something times. You know how many times uh, someone riding on the clouds is is not Yahweh? I'm, I'm going to give zero. It's a zero. So the Son of Man who is claiming or who is riding on the clouds of heaven is who could only be Yahweh. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom. One that shall not be destroyed. Anything you'd like to add to that, Mr. Thaddeus? I would just say that this is a really important passage for even for Christians to realize, because even among Christians, I often see people say, well, this when C Jesus says he's the son of man and the son of God, well, son of man mm -hmm. reflects his humanity. And that's not really accurate. It's right. actually a reflection of this title here from mm -hmm. Daniel 7. Yeah, the, the Son of Man. No, I can call you a Son of Man. I can call anybody Son of Man. I can call anybody a Son of God, right? But the context of the, the passage and how it's used and how the Son of Man is a cloud rider, which has only been attributed to Yahweh over 70 times in the Old Testament. And I'm pretty sure there's a scene, Thaddeus, from the Gospels, uh, you might have to help me out, where the um, the the Pharisees and scribes, right, this, of, of the Sanhedrin, um, tear their robes after Jesus says this, this phrase, you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven and they tear their robes. Why would they tear their robes and, and pronounce blasphemy and say, what else do we need from him? If he's just going, Hey, by the way, I'm just a human being. I kind of think I'm the Messiah. What, what, what did, what did they understand him to be saying? Yeah, apparently they understood exactly what he meant. They understood that he was taking that he was claiming that Daniel 7 was written about him. Bingo, right? And he's claiming to be the cloud rider. He's claiming to be Yahweh himself. And there's a million other passages that we're not going to get into because that's not exactly it's not exactly the the purpose of this uh today. So what, what we're really here talking about is that it's, it's clear that Jesus fulfills prophecy after prophecy in a very, not just kind of general way, but a very profound way. And to any person who is enlightened to this information, they ought to really consider how would it be possible for such things to come to pass without all of these little details being weaved together by some sort of divine mind. So the prophetic fulfillments ought to give anyone pause and any atheist or make any muslim they, they should become jealous of this why because well the the muslims false prophet doesn't even have a single fulfilled prophecy and well that's not entirely true actually thaddeus i i think he fulfills a general prophecy of false prophets but he doesn't fulfill any good positive positive ones right so yeah go ahead buddy oh i i was just thinking um I was kind of laughing to myself when you said that, but he he doesn't actually fulfill any prophecy of the gospel or the Old Testament, yet he claims he does. So mm -hmm. then Muslims go to the Bible and they try to find prophecies of Muhammad in it, of course. Right. But I think that any any honest person would look at, at you know, something like Psalm 22 yeah. and, and look at that and say that that fits Jesus pretty well. And then mm -hmm. they they look at something that a Muslim claims about Muhammad and they'd be like, what? <laughs> right. How is this supposed to be about Muhammad exactly? And in, in one of the tafsir, um, I think it's seven one fifty seven. Don't, don't quote me if I'm wrong, but one of the, one of the tafsirs uh, mentions the description of the unlettered prophet of, of Muhammad should, it should be as clear as knowing him in person. Right. So I know this isn't a stream about the, the unfulfilled prophecies uh, 
regarding Muhammad from the Bible, but their own criteria, at least one of their their commentators says that when you read him, when you find him in the in the Bible, it should be as clear as knowing him. Whereas I would make the argument if I only had to pick one, I would say Isaiah 53 is as clear as the the crucifixion and the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ as as you could possibly possibly get, right? Um so yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, it's not about Muhammad not fulfilling these prophecies. It, this is about Jesus. The stream is about Jesus, mm -hmm. um, of course. But if, if the Old Testament is saying these things about Jesus, and we can see that it's using language that can only properly be described right. as God, and mm -hmm. then Jesus fulfills that in the New Testament, I guess there's basically two possibilities, or or maybe three that two. One is that it that this is legitimate good evidence of, that Jesus is in fact God. Mm -hmm. um, you could throw out the the Muslim hypothesis that originally the gospel said something completely different and the <laughs> Old Testament said something completely different uh -huh. and then uh, it was corrupted and we have zero archaeological yep. evidence or anything of that. Which makes Allah absolutely either inept or malicious because he repeats over and over again that the gospel and Injil are his words. And then he clearly declares in Surah 6, 115, that no man can change Allah's words. But the Muslims, they like to deny what Allah says to them in their in their Quran. And guess what? Apparently that he did change his he, he did allow man to change his words, or he changed the words himself, making him either just evil or malicious, <laughs> or the men did change it, but he just apparently didn't have the power to stop them from changing it. At any rate, my conclusion to this is the Quran clearly tells you that Allah cannot be God, but it's neither here nor there. Yeah, and it's funny because if you look at like the really early Muslim writings, they took the Quran seriously and they, they thought that the Christian scriptures would confirm them. And they, that's right. how they, they went out. And, you know, when they tried to convert Christians, they would go, oh, like, yeah. your scriptures testify to Muhammad. What are you uh -huh. talking about? And then they eventually <laughs> got a hold of them, translated into Arabic in the ninth century or whatever. And then they're like, oh, these don't actually match up. So I... what they should have done is rejected the scripture that made the claim but instead what they did is say okay this means the christians are, are li evil liars who changed everything my uh i don't know why this just came to me but this this to me is almost like um are there any, if there's parents if there's any children and within earshot please cover their ears especially if they're young um i'm not going to say any bad words i'm going to i'm going to ruin their childhood and talk about santa claus here for a second so if anybody's got kids around now's the time to Okay, so this would be like a um, like the earliest Muslims, right? Who had never read the Bible. What I imagine them doing is like like a child whose parents goes, "Oh, by the way, you know, there's there's no Santa Claus," um, and the kids are like, "No, that's not true. That's not true." And then they like travel to the North Pole and scour it over and over again, and they can't find uh, you know Santa or his reindeer or his elves or Mrs. Claus or anyone and all of the evidence just basically says look Santa Claus is not like a real thing but then they come back and they're like well we didn't find Santa Claus but that's because you guys moved him like what <laughs> like that's ridiculous um but anyway uh that's we've gotten off topic I apologize but as you were going through that, that for whatever reason that just came to me it's just like the, the kid who just refused right they just well we read it and we see all the evidence that our book is wrong and that Santa doesn't exist but we're just we still believe it and if you know then yeah and let's move on <laughs> yeah so the, the third one um which would be what atheists would typically say is mm -hmm. some combination of Jesus purposely fulfilling prophecies and right Christian writers inventing uh, mm -hmm. events that didn't actually happen. And I think we'll probably get to that when we get to the historical part. Well, I'm not going to quite cover that, but I think that could be something uh, interesting for, for the future. And that's something to take in, into consideration um, as well. But what would trump that is what we're going to get into, which is explanatory power. Okay. We're, we're going to get into the explanatory power of um, the, the historicity of Jesus, the early Christian movement, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're going to be here for six hours if I keep going off on tangents. Thaddeus, 
what is this amateur hour? Yeah, <laughs> I'm here. So it is. Um, all right. So uh, aside from the fulfilled prophecy, right. And we talked about how the, the author of the Quran, um, you know, he's kind of an ignorant person. Um, actually, let me go ahead and keep going on this. I have notes by the way. Um, so yeah, the prophetic fulfillment, which we're talking about might give us pause, right? The false prophet. So one key point that I want to emphasize is this, right? The, the, the Quran is, is not absolutely not a continuation of the biblical text, right? The new Testament, at least the authors of the new Testament will say that they were divinely inspired or they were just random human beings. At least they took the time to make allusions or direct quotes to the previous scripture, 933 times, 933 times, right? The Quran quotes the Bible once, and as it says, an eye for an eye, right? That's the only thing it says. That's a direct quote from the Bible. So it seems to me that the author of the Quran was ignorant to the contents of the Bible. So speaking of ignorance, this is why we're going to go into logistics. So where does the Quran get the name of Jesus from? His name is Isa, right? Here's, here's your fun answer. Everybody's got a theory, right? Theories are kind of like, uh, you know, everybody's got one. <laughs> um, we'll call them noses. Everybody's got one. Uh, <laughs> answer, right? There are over a dozen, a dozen pretty good theories on where the name Isa came from to be derived from Jesus, but none of them have the full explanatory power, right? Some say that this is maybe one of the leading ones. Some say that it's a transliteration from the Hebrew, right? Yeshua to the Greek, Isus, and then from the Greek into the Aramaic, which is Isu, and then from the Aramaic to Arabic, which is Isa. Okay. If that's true, someone please explain to me how that could have come from God, right? And not just some ignorant man wandering around uh, 600 years after the fact going, uh, his name was Isa. Um, they just didn't know. Uh, my good buddy, Jai Apologetics, uh, everyone should go check out his streams, like, subscribe, all that kind of fun stuff. He has an entire live stream. And and by the way, he speaks, uh, he speaks uh, Hebrew uh, and uh, Arabic, fluently. Um, and I think he's pretty good with Greek too. I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver here. Um, but he, he knows the language really well and he's gone into the linguistics of where Isa came from. So go check out his channel and, and you can find that it was like a two hour live stream. It was incredibly informative the whole time. So the bottom line is this, the almighty Allah is kind of an idiot when it comes to linguistics. Um, and the good news is Allah seems to be only slightly more literate than the man who he sent uh, Jibril to choke slam in a cave. Speaking of good news, um, next slide here, please. The gospel. Oh, hold on. Um, we did have an alternate theory of, about uh, how Muhammad got the name Isa. Uh, apparently he was a tad deaf in his right ear, so he just didn't hear it properly. <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, that's, we'll put that as number 13 of the, of the theories that could possibly work. So. Yeah. Um, actually, no, sorry. Go back, buddy. Um, so speaking of good news, in Jeel, um, nowhere in Arabic does in Jeel have any meaning whatsoever. It's a completely nonsensical word. It doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, we know that the gospel means, what, what does the gospel mean? Good news. Good news. What does in Jeel mean? In Arabic, anybody know? Going once, going twice, nothing. It literally means nothing. You couldn't be, you couldn't be going out into the world as an as a native Arabic speaker and try to tell someone, "Oh, Injil, Injil, I've got good news." Got good. That's not what you would say. It's a completely, it's it's a it's a word that is, by the way, this is derived from the Greek elongilion, right? That's where that comes from. And once again, Allah decided that he was just going to transliterate something from which was originally Hebrew or Aramaic and take it from the Greek because he's perfect and all knowing and then transliterate it into the Arabic. Right. But the issue is, is it lost its meaning, right? The meaning of the word 
which is good news, Elongilion loses its meaning as it's in Gil. It completely lost its meaning. So if they wanted to maintain the meaning of it, good news could be like Akbar Sar, uh, Bashari, or Yubashir Bakar, okay? And forgive me, I'm not that great, but that, those are actual words that mean good news. In Gil is completely meaningless, right? More recently, um, we're starting to come into knowledge that there are books upon books written about the grammatical and linguistic and linguistic errors and abnormalities found in the Quran. Muslims want us to believe that the Quran is the direct speech of Allah, even if Allah cannot speak a single language, i.e. <laughs> Arabic, correctly. Um, looks like we got a question up here. It's not really a question. Um, a comment from uh, Dr. Johannes. The problem is that the name Isa can't be found in any pre-Islamic text. This is the Arabic form uh, of Jesus. Then how come no pre-Islamic text exists in which has no, the name? Isa? Exactly, and that's why, and that's why no answer given is a good answer, right? Nobody has any idea. So, um, one of the things that Jai goes into is uh, from, I believe it's Eastern Syriac, um, which is basically Aramaic. Um, the word Isa, again, sorry kids, it, it basically means the uh, I'm gonna try to try to make this sound a little more PG, but it basically means the um, reproductive fluid that comes out of a stallion or a horse, right? This is and these are legitimate theories that linguistic like linguists have come up with. Uh, because it is so absurd that anyone would would take Jesus, Yeshua, um, Isus and turn it into Isa. It, it's it's so absurd. Nobody has any idea. Um, but anyway, go go watch his video anyhow. So, well, yeah. Yeah. Ahead, getting buddy. back to Angel, uh, I have a question for you. How many? Uh -huh. uh, so Allah seems to think that the Angel is a book. How many gospel do we have that are books? Well, I mean, obviously there are four canonical gospels, right? Um, we back in the day, and we can even now say the gospel, right? The gospel we just generally mean the the message of Jesus Christ, right? And and we can say that as the four canonical gospels. Um, there was a uh, work undertaken. It's called the Didache. What's it called? Where the guy tried to. Um, so I believe in the second century he harmonized right. all four gospels. Um, so, so that could be what they're referring to. But at the end of the day, honestly, we're giving them way too much credit. Muhammad heard somebody say the word gospel or Injil or whatever it is, right? And he thought, oh, Injil was what it was called originally in the Hebrew or the Greek or whatever. He had no idea from it. He heard absurd stories, which uh, I know you and Lloyd go into this and Lloyd and I've gone into this as well. You get Gnostic. It, it's a Gnostic text, Jesus, right? And we're going to get into this actually in, in the history stuff. So um, what's his face? Jason, Jason Bourne, if you're still here, you're going to want to pay attention. So we're going to get into the historicity of this kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, what you're looking for was the diatessaron. Yes, diatessaron. And, sorry. And uh, so that this would be a synthesis of, of the four gospels, very mm -hmm. early text. Uh Maybe not super relevant for today, but it actually is a really important piece of evidence because we, we believe that was probably actually more popular than the four canonical gospels. And there, there's this drive even today that, you know, people want one single story. They don't want mm -hmm. four. But the church, when the, the process of canonization was taking place, they said, we want the authentic. We don't want what's popular. We don't want what's easy. We want the authentic. So exactly. it gives a really important piece of evidence that the church wasn't just taking whatever people liked or, or taking what, I mean, it's not, to be clear, the, the work is completely orthodox in mm -hmm. theology. It's just a combination of the four gospels it combined into one continuous story, as opposed to you reading each one individually. Right. No, and that's that's a good point. But we we also use it for textual criticism and and all kinds of fun stuff, which we could get into on a completely other live stream. Um, all right, moving on to the 
probably the the linguistics thing is really just to make fun of the Quran and just to say, look, this couldn't <laughs> possibly be from God. Um, so therefore, it does not have the authority as of God as is completely whatever it says in it. I mean, how many scientific and historical mistakes are there in the in the Quran? Is there a number on that, Thaddeus? Uh, there's there's not a hard number because, you know, it, it's kind of a matter of opinion. But I, I'm quite certain that anyone who's objective will say it's definitely more than zero and right. a lot more than zero. <laughs> right. I mean, but it, and it says, you know, that you if the book had been from anyone but Allah, you would find. What, how's that? How's that finished, Thaddeus? I can't remember. Uh, much contradiction or much inconsistency. <laughs> that in itself is problematic. That in itself is one hundred percent problematic. If there's a book from God that says, and it's going to make it, and it's going to make an announcement about how many contradictions are in it, how many are you going to expect the book to say? I'm going to go with zero. Zero. You will not find any contradictions in this book. But the claim, the book is not even confident enough in itself to make the claim that there are no contradictions. It's just much. And I, I still have not got a direct number on how much much is, right? Uh, I've not got any more answer besides, you know, uh, what Bill Clinton, he gave the definition of de it depends on what the word is, is means. I don't know. This is how absurd that particular argument is. It just can't be from God, people. So you can't treat the Quran as some divine book you have to look at it through a historical lens and this is what we're trying to get to thaddeus i know you're you're wanting to say things and i'm just talking so go ahead <laughs> no no you're, you're you're fine uh i i do have a, a definitive answer for you on how much much is and that's exactly one more contradiction than whatever the reader finds within it oh that's true that's true it is it's uh it's subjective. It's subjective. We use subjective and, and unfalsifiable claims. That's the most important thing about Islam, which we're going to get into falsifiability of claims and how important those are for historical um, critiques as well. All right. So let's talk history. Everybody's favorite Imam Bart Ehrman, although I think recently he's kind of destroyed the Muslim claims and I don't think they like him as much as they once did. <laughs> um, but here's a quote from Bart Ehrman. One of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Okay. End of story. Full stop. Mic drop. End of story. What happened to Jesus? What? Okay. Tell, I'm, I'm going to give you something that's a very certain fact of history, Thaddeus. And according to this quote from Bart Ehrman, it's not as reliable and it's not as factual as Jesus being crucified by Pontius Pilate. Okay. The destruction of the Roman temple, 70 AD, more or less reliable, according to this quote, historically than Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to say that Bart Ehrman would say that for sure, that, uh, but I mean, it's at least on the same level, right? Right, it, exactly. Very, so we're, we're taking it out of context. I agree with you, right? But <laughs> it's so certain, right, that it's on the same level as like, I don't know, uh, an entire temple being absolutely destroyed like that's how certain it is but anyway we as as apologists we know that our muslim counterparts are going to ignore historical facts um they're going to ignore historians whom they always lean to because bart ehrman says that you can't know exactly what the bible said so he's on our team like come on people, grow up yeah um, it's quite humorous how it, it doesn't matter what you're discussing you know you could be discussing Moses, and they'd be like, "Well, Bart Ehrman says the gospel's corrupted." <laughs> I'm like, you realize that you can only quote him on textual criticism of the New Testament. That's his only area of actual expertise. But right, you know, whatever. Yeah, and to be honest with you, I actually like the guy, and the research that he does, I think, is very important. And I think the research and the conclusions that one can draw from his thing are in favor of Christianity. Um. So we can we can talk about that. Oh, Nano, we got Nano. And I mean, you got to bring up Nano because Nano said something that uh, makes me want to take my Shahada. Um, Nano the, said that Islam is the fastest. Oh, okay. no, 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 no. Islam is the fastest growing oh, yeah, religion. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. I just as of pre <laughs> Pew Research 2017. Yeah. Um, so you're telling. So, what was it before 2017? <laughs> Is it is it currently the largest religion, Nano? 
Uh, are you going to always appeal to popularity as your way of just determining what truth is? I mean, I don't know about your your mom, Thaddeus, but my mom would always say, you know, if all your friends jump off a bridge, you're going to jump off with them. So popularity of something has nothing to do with the truthfulness of something. Um, so there you go, Nano. But Nano likes Bart, so that's that's important. Uh, Bart, and, and of course. <laughs> Of course, we all know that how you establish the truth of a particular position is mm -hmm. how many children you have, because that's how Islam is the fastest growing religion, have more children per family on average. Therefore, it grows faster. Therefore, it is more true. Yeah. And and the other interesting thing to, to, to think about, Nano, is, is Islam the fastest growing religion in, let's say, Iran? or america or russia right it's 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 dependent upon which nation so if it's if it's growing faster in one nation but like the second or third fastest in another nation does that mean it's true in one place and false in another <laughs> i mean pathetic anyhow uh let's move on to history stuff one of the most certain facts about history is that jesus was crucified under the orders of the roman prefect pontius pilate okay let's go how many wives helps? <laughs> yeah, well, the more wives you have, the more children you can have. It's pretty much pretty much how that works. All uh, righty, let me take a look at my notes here. Um, yeah, history in a nutshell. Let's let's move on. Let's move it uh, move it forward. See if I got this right. All right, so history in a nutshell. Uh, how does history work, guys? This is basically how history works. We have we need to look at early witness testimony. We want to see also enemy attestation testimony, people who don't even like the people, what they have to say about the events. We want to take a, take a look at uh, not only early witness testimony, but how many different independent witnesses do we have for those testimonies? We also need to take into account the criteria of embarrassment. We need to take into consideration whether or not the uh, testimonies include falsifiable claims or verifiable claims. Basically, if I tell you that uh, the shirt was purple, you can tell me if the shirt's purple or blue or green or yellow, right? That's a falsifiable claim. But if I tell you that I saw a pink elephant flying across the sky, you can't falsify that information, right? You can go, well, it's I've never seen that happen, but you can't falsify it, right? So it's important when we look at history to see if those eyewitnesses, those early witness attestations that are independent are making falsifiable claims. And then we can check on their claims to see if their claims are true or false, okay? And then last and not least, we need to take, uh, we need to take into consideration explanatory power. Does the eyewitness testimony and the, the narrative essentially explain perfectly all of the different criteria and events that has gone on. Um, anything you want to make comments on that, Thaddeus? Uh, I think I'll just come. Are you going to go through each one? Uh, kind of, yes. They're all going to be hit on. I don't necessarily hit on them uh, directly, but yes. Okay, well, I'll just make a, a quick comment then off, off the top that of these... You know, there, these are all criteria we can use to help judge whether a, a work is reliable. Um, obviously, the claims have to be falsifiable. That that's just a given. You you can't right make judgment about claims that aren't falsifiable. But mm -hmm. other than that, the the most important are probably expiratory power mm -hmm. and uh, multiple witnesses, independent yeah. multiple independent witnesses, because people tend to think that history is mostly based on archaeology, and that's mm -hmm. not at all true. Right. Uh, history is almost entirely based on written documents. So how do you know if a author, and I'm talking secular history here, how do you mm -hmm. know if an author is reliable? Well, you might be able to confirm something, very basic facts, like there was this building from archaeology. But for the most part, you need some, you, you have to judge whether the author knows what they're talking about. And how do you do that? Well, if two independent authors both say the same but not identical thing because if mm -hmm. they say identical then one just copy from the other exactly but, but they they say similar things that enhances not only the reliability of the first source but the second as well so two mm -hmm. authors say the same thing it enhances the reliability of both sources and then then when the you know author a says some things that aren't confirmed by anyone else you can have reasonable confidence that those are true that it's not that you need multiple attestation of everything this is how you judge 
the author, how you judge the author's credibility mm -hmm. by what you can test, which mostly means against other documents. No, but yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, and the other thing that I don't really go into too much is the criteria of embarrassment. Um, I can I can elaborate on that now, or if that is, if you want to talk about how important that is too. Uh, you can elaborate on it. Okay. So the criteria of embarrassment is is basically if if I'm best friends with someone, I genuinely like them, right? Um, and I'm going to fabricate, or, or sorry, I'm just going to tell a truthful story about them. Am I more or less likely to remove embarrassing facts about that person, right? I'm probably going to remove embarrassing facts about them, right? But if I include that embarrassing fact and I love that person, then it's a really, there's really no motive for me to just make up some embarrassing fact about someone who I love and I'm trying to promote, right? So it's really important to, to take into consideration the criteria of embarrassment. Make sense? All right, let's, let's move on. All right. All right, let's do that. All right, early, and by the way, when I say early, I mean within the first 100 years, or really 70 years of the crucifixion of Jesus, early, independent witnesses from the first century, okay? So we got Matthew, the author of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We have enemy attestation, Tacitus, Josephus, Celsius, right? We've just got general, independent, Marabar, Sarpion, Plenty the Younger. Uh, again, back to friendly. We've got Paul. We've got whoever the author of Hebrews is. And if it's Paul, we'll just roll it up in Paul. If it's not, then we'll just call it an independent one. And Peter, all of these talk about the uh, life, and particularly I'm focused for this one fact or the historical fact on the crucifixion, because that's the biggest difference. That's the most falsifiable claim that that uh, we can we can argue about between the Quran, what the Quran says about Jesus, and what the Bible says about Jesus. I'm not I'm not counting here, but that's what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, twelve to thirteen, depending upon what we do with Hebrews. Independent attestations, including two to three. I don't think Celsus, Celsus liked Christians much. Three enemy attestations. They all said the same thing. That is, they all said Jesus was crucified. Indeed. Hmm. And, you know, the, this is actually a, a very embarrassing fact, actually, uh, because if he is claiming to be the Messiah, if he's claiming to be a prophet, and then he's put to death in the most humiliating way, uh, the crucifixion was so disliked uh, among the Roman people, so debased the person who did it, or who was crucified, I mean, that they often, most often, would not even refer to the word crucifixion. They, right. they would use a, a metaphor or a right. euphemism to get around it because that's how humiliating it is to be crucified. This is what basically the Romans invented the process to dehumanize the victim of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. So you're again, we're, we're talking about the criteria of embarrassment. Why would someone just make this up? Um, yeah, well, can we can move on to the next one, buddy? All right. Later witnesses, right? What does the Quran use? Well, later witnesses. So we don't start to see the development or even the introduction or even the hint of Gnostic texts until the second century, typically the mid part of the second century. So over a hundred years after the death of Jesus, were any of those people who start to write these, I'm not a mathematician. I don't know how long people lived, but were any of those <laughs> people who wrote them eyewitnesses to the crucifixion? No, they, they sometimes took the name of eyewitnesses, but no one believes that they act that there's attributed right. names so yeah like the gnostic them. apocalypse of peter from like what 275 a.d because peter apparently was not um killed in 62 or 64 a.d he lived another you know 150 years um before before writing the gnostic apocalypse of of peter so automatically when you say like the the gnostic uh the, the infancy gospel of thomas or uh the gospel of james or whatever like and and the authors are clearly were not alive at the time that this book was penned. You can kind of go ahead and say, well, this is this is a forgery, right? This is not true. And then the fact that the claims that they make, literally no 
falsifiable claims or if there are any like details in there that you could go falsify like locations uh people who were alive at the particular time of jesus whatever it is guess what they're mostly pretty much all wrong right whereas when you take a look at the gospels the geography the historical figures that were alive at the time um and even some stuff that we didn't find out to like the 1800s that that people thought oh this is false the bible just made it up well, all of a sudden you know uh, here it is. Here's Bathsheba or, um, whatever, Beer, Beersheba, Beersheba. Uh, it comes out of nowhere. Um, so anyway, the, the, the Gnostic texts don't make falsifiable claims. And if they do, they're false typically. And then the Quran. Okay. When was the Quran allegedly revealed? That is. That would be in the seventh century over a period of 23 years. Yeah. So it was what, 610, 610 AD. Is that when the, the call, the first, when uh, Jabril choke slammed that dude in the cave, forced him to read? Yes. Against his I, will. I suppose that's when the, the revelation of the Quran starts. I, I'm not 100% certain that and they he, made it to and, 610, but. And he ran screaming down the mountain and hid <laughs> under his blankets, asking his wife to cover me, cover me. I fear that something awful might happen to me. Yep. And, and he <laughs> thought that he, he you know, he, he himself described his encounter as either being uh, demon possessed or being a poet, which he also thought was something very horrific. So his initial opinion of his own revelation was that it was something horrible and I think he was right on that one, at least. Yeah, I think his first impression was absolutely correct. He went from, uh, from what I recall, based on the stories, assuming that they're true, he was like a stand-up guy, like the most truthful man that ever lived. And he married this like older woman and kind of, you know, helped her run her affairs and stayed married to just one wife. He was monogamous. Like, what a nice guy. Right. What a super nice guy. And then after he has this encounter where he's, you know, choke slammed in a cave, um, does he does he remain a nice guy? No, I, I, I don't think so. Not by any any standards we'd use today. Uh, it should be pointed out that these facts, such as Muhammad uh, torturing a man who who wouldn't reveal the location of his treasure, were not necessarily embarrassing at, at the time. Yeah, uh, Muhammad marrying a six-year-old girl, not necessarily embarrassing at the time. So we can't necessarily say that they're, they're true. Yeah. Um, we have to come to our own judgment on that. We can't just say that uh, all these events really happened. Mm -hmm. But the, the point being, if, if we if we assume they're true, and Muslims certainly believe they're true, mm -hmm. then no, he, he was changed for the worse by his encounter. Yep. Nope. 100%. So, um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about the Quran coming 600 years later. Uh, oh, by the way, by the way, all the authors of the Bible and um, even the non-authors of the Bible that were on the on the slide before, um, not only were they first century witnesses when eyewitnesses were still alive, and if they made up a lie, eyewitnesses could counter whatever it was that they said. Um, they also, it's weird, I know, but they were from the location geographically of the life and teachings of Jesus. Um, that should be noted because the Quran comes over 600 years later and uh, over a thousand kilometers away. Um, so you can't look at the Quran as a historical text about the life and teachings of Jesus. And a lot of the previous statements I've made, I know I'm kind of being mocking a little bit, uh, but everything I've said, is is true based on what um the most authentic islamic sources say um it, this book can't be from god it can't be from god so then you have then, then it forces you to just read it from a historical perspective and no one ever would read this book for historical like oh i wonder what happened to jesus uh let me let me read it in a book that calls him isa and we can't figure out where that linguistically came from at all it's a complete mystery um and all of its stories about jesus remind us of gnostic texts that come from you know a hundred plus years after jesus um you know let's let's nobody's gonna do that nobody's gonna go to the quran and go yeah this is the greatest historical text on the life and teachings of a jewish man living 600 years earlier a thousand kilometers north it's preposterous 
yeah, you, there's a, for the last hundred years or so, they've been these movements and scholarship called historical Jesus studies, where they supposedly try to uncover the real historical Jesus mm -hmm. that stripped of all the theology of the, the New Testament and whatnot. But uh, to the best of your knowledge, has any one of those efforts ever even remotely considered the Quran as a historical source? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, no, I'm kidding. No one has ever cited the Quran. They go, well, the Quran says as a historical textual data that, uh, no, nobody, nobody would ever, ever look to that. No historian would ever look to that. And by the way, it, it, it the, the Quran makes exactly zero falsifiable claims about Jesus. Can't falsify virgin birth, right? Can't falsify bringing a, a dove to life or whatever, right? Can't, like, every single thing it says you can't falsify. Like, not one thing about the life. It doesn't say, like, where he was, where, what, when he was, who he, like, who he talked. Like, nothing, right? The only thing they have is his mother and him and no no falsifiable or verifiable information whatsoever about it. I'm not a genius, but I can tell you right away that that's a made up story. Just going <laughs> to just going to throw it out there because if I'm lying about something, I'm going to give you information you can't falsify. And the Quran, well, <laughs> it does a really good job at that, not just with Jesus, but with pretty much everything. Pretty much everything else. And I did also want to briefly touch on the the gnostic texts here. Mm -hmm. One interesting piece of evidence that the the Gnostic texts provide is that they very rarely cover the same events of the New Testament. That they, they often cover the the youth of of Jesus. They often cover uh, events that that are not described in the Gospels, and they take a different picture entirely of the um, crucifixion and resurrection. And the reason, and this is important, is well, they're not attaching on the thing that you'd think they would be touching on. Mm -hmm. And that's because these texts realize that that is already accepted. That's yeah. already accepted canon of scripture. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if they want to get their own ideas in there, they have to come up with, oh, well, you didn't know this about Jesus. You didn't know about right. what he did as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, so that they take other events that are not described in the, in the Gospels, mm -hmm. and they talk about those, uh, especially the youth of Jesus, because, you know, other than one or two isolated stories, it's basically Jesus was born, and then uh, John appeared baptizing people, and Jesus started his public ministry. Right. So they fill in that gap, because they mm -hmm. are, no, they, the authors of those texts basically know that people already have good information about all the the rest of the, Jesus's life, so they can't write about that. People instantly know that it's fake. So even though um, the the Gnostic texts are, are worthless for direct history, mm -hmm. they're very useful for understanding what the theology of the church was, what the canon of Scripture was, mm -hmm. what um, what people who did not want to be part of the church attacked, uh, right. that kind of thing. So. When you hear these people say, well, the church just arbitrarily picks some texts and that's why we have these and those other ones were thrown out, but they're just as good. They're just as valid. They just had a different interpretation of events and we don't know which one's correct. Could be either one. That's total nonsense. And mm -hmm. no atheist secular scholar who was trying to learn information about Jesus would go to these Gnostic texts and say, well, these are pretty much equally valid. I got to just decide which one's the correct one right? Um, because they're, they're, they're written later, but not only are they written later, they, ex they basically uh, betray the fact that the God, the canonical gospels are already well known and accepted. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. And um, one other thing I wanted to, to, to mention was uh, we were talking about the criteria of embarrassment. Right. And I mentioned that if I was trying to like, tell a story about my friend, I would probably leave out or change certain things that would be embarrassing to him when I'm telling you the story. What does the Quran do with Jesus? Right? Because we just said the earliest and even the Gnostic text they are like, Oh, well, Jesus was crucified, but it was like, not really, you know, and then the Quran goes on to say that, um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to take away the embarrassment, right? Which is a clear indication, um, that, that they're making it up. Right. 
why would the earliest eyewitnesses put this in and then later people who have no nobody that was an eyewitness to correct them just make these things up well it's because they don't they don't understand the importance of the story and then they don't like it because they feel like it's embarrassing and so they just they just change it Good point. Um, right right uh hello kitty by the way <laughs> We, we have Tom joining us today. He's up, uh, been very rambunctious. He was trying to, he was trying to bite me earlier, but <laughs> <laughs> you, you kept your face super stoic though, man. You're just like, it's all good. <laughs> You're allowed to yell if he latches on just so you know. <laughs> all right. Uh, check out to the next on, slide. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. All right. All right. So here, here's basically the Quran's claim about the crucifixion. Um, so Quran four one fifty seven, and by, by the way, you're supposed to assume that this is the actual words of God that they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, a messenger of Allah, but they killed him not nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge but only conjecture to follow for of a surety they killed him not. Um, <laughs> that is, why don't you say a few things about this before I, before I go off on a tangent? <laughs> sure. I, of course, the, we probably all know that the dominant Muslim interpretation of this is that someone was crucified. It was not Jesus. There, that person was miraculously made to appear to be Jesus. And then Jesus was taken up into heaven in bodily form and no one saw him again. Uh, Islam Critiques has a great video on this. Um, he was talking to an author about it, a live stream earlier this week. And he actually pointed out that a, a few early Muslims realized that this makes the Quran theologically a nightmare mm -hmm. because it, it makes Allah responsible for deceiving everyone. It makes Allah responsible for the rise of Orthodox Christianity because this is why Christians believe that, that Jesus rose from the dead is because he, he was seen alive in bodily form. And mm -hmm. apparently Allah could, instead of, and of course, it also makes Allah um, impotent because he could have just stopped the crucifixion from taking place. But instead, he put someone else up there who was not guilty in any way. So he it's feared, all kinds. He of, feared angering the Jews, so he just tricked them instead. Yeah, so it has all kinds of <laughs> theological problems for Muslims. But nonetheless, this is like if you ask 100 Muslims, probably 98 would agree with that interpretation of, mm -hmm. of this verse. And the remaining two would would be considered heretics by the other 98. So no, no, you're right. And and so basically you said kind of all the main points that I wanted to say, but that was that was really good. Um so basically there's no argument that Jesus wasn't crucified. So the, the Quran is really stupid about this fact. Uh the Quran claims Sir 4157 that Jesus was not crucified, which we know historically is 100 percent wrong. So not only is the Quran wrong in this historical fact, but it's also wrong in several other ways just found within this one single verse. Okay, first of all, I love this. The Jews claimed that they killed their Messiah. Real quick question here for you, Thaddeus. Would a Jew <laughs> in boast, as it says in that translation, in boast desire to kill the Messiah whom they believe is the messiah would they call him the messiah no uh, of course the quran doesn't know what messiah means no uh, it course. just arbitrarily gives jesus this title never explains what it means or anything right. uh, which is why the the author of this could could think that jews would boast about that um it's certainly plausible that some jews boasted about killing jesus uh mm -hmm. it's certainly right. plausible that some jews in the seventh century were using it as a polemic against Christians saying, mm -hmm. ha ha, we killed your supposed God. Right. Um, but they certainly wouldn't be saying, yes, we killed our Messiah. 
right? As Allah clearly says here in, in this verse, that the Jews believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and yet they killed him anyway. It's preposterous, right? So you, you kind of hit on this. Theologically, what does this mean for the Quran, right? Um, so basically, if this is true, if this is true, it means that, uh, you know, Allah was the one who miraculously tricked everyone into thinking that it was Jesus who was who was crucified. But really, it wasn't it, the idiot or the malicious Allah did this. And as a result of his perfect trickery, and as you mentioned, Thaddeus, even Jesus closest followers died believing that Jesus was actually the person crucified often dying themselves, horrifying death, or at least facing severe persecution because of their beliefs that their Messiah was killed and, by the way, resurrected. So either Mr. Idiot Allah forgot to inform them of his little deception, or Allah is so evil and malicious that he forgot to inform, or that he just wanted the followers of Jesus, who was his own Messiah, to commit shirk, which is basically a guaranteed one-way ticket to hell. Um, so Mr. Allah here, he says in the verse that Christians are in doubt. Here's another issue here. Uh, we're in doubt, and we differ about this, right? Right, That is, We differ about <laughs> who was on the cross, if it's Jesus or not. No, nobody ever has differed about this. However, the perfect words of Allah say that we do. We never did. Meanwhile, none of the greatest commentators of the Quran can actually agree upon what happened. Um, if you click on the next slide here. Uh, before we go on, I, I do want to address this comment from uh, Dr. Johannes. He says, uh, regarding the crucifixion, if Allah acted to save Isa, does that mean that Allah also played an active role in the death of Muhammad? Who is poisoned by a Jesus, a, a Jewish woman, and um, I would, I actually, I've proposed this kind of thing, um, you know, that Allah, by by making by saving Jesus and and, and doing this deception caused, you know, to, a couple billion Christians to to go astray, and mm -hmm. a Muslim said in response to me something like. Allah is not responsible for what happens after his actions. <laughs> but um, well, he's ignore. the best of deceivers. What in the world? <laughs> like, <laughs> even just, ignoring that, they, they saw it with every single sense they had. They they witnessed this death, and well, whose fault was it? Who's, whose fault? Yeah, well, apparently no one's. Apparently, it's the Christians' fault for for falling for the deception. I guess uh, I don't know. Makes sense um, if you don't but, think about but it. But even ignoring a, that ridiculous aspect here, um, so the supposed reason that Jesus had to be saved and and couldn't be allowed to be crucified or, or in any other fashion, um, other than just being taken up into heaven right away, um, was because he was so amazingly holy and, and such a perfect messenger and and all that, but. Muhammad died a painful death by his own description, a humiliating death, even because he was poisoned by oh, an enemy. You don't understand, though, buddy. That was a martyrdom. <laughs> he was martyred. Jesus was not martyred because he was rescued, because that's embarrassing. But, you know, he was martyred. Muhammad. Okay. There you Just go. as long as we got that cleared up. We're clear. <laughs> don't don't bring logic into this KC. Come on, this is this is ridiculous. Go ahead and click on that little link there that says Tafsirs. Hopefully the link works. Um and you can just kind of scroll through it. I'm just going to kind of briefly briefly talk about it, right? So this is this is the commentaries on on the verse where it claims that Jesus was not crucified. So uh you'll see that Ibn Abbas basically makes the claim that it was Tatianus they give a name. Tatianos was the one who was crucified. Uh, Jala Lane is going to say something along the lines of it being Sergius was the person who was crucified in, 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 instead of Jesus. Uh, Kathir has his own little thing. One of the followers of Jesus stood up three times and said, I want to do it. I want to do it. And then Jesus was like, no, you can't be crucified instead of me or whatever. And then finally he let him do it. So the, uh, one of Jesus followers was crucified instead of him, according to him. And guys, keep in mind, by the way, that, um, <laughs> it's according to Allah, it's the Christians who were in doubt. 
we are we are in doubt about this. We differ. We differ. Sergius Tatiano, some random kid that stood up three times. Uh, there's another one. I can't remember who else said it. Uh, Nathanios was one of them. There's maybe someone named Nathanios who was crucified. Uh, later commentators are going to say, well, actually it was uh, uh, Jesus' betrayer. It was uh, Judas uh, uh, who was who was betrayed. Uh, and then he was he was really crucified. Uh, or maybe it was Simon of Cyrene, the guy who like helped Jesus carry his cross. Maybe they just got confused. The, the Roman executors got confused and crucified the wrong guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, how wrong can one single verse be? How absolutely wrong can it be? Right? They say that we differ. We Christians are in doubt. Do Christians never never go. Oh, I think it was maybe somebody else. Uh, I think that was. <laughs> it's like no right so i can't make up the stupidity of this guys i really can't i wish i could i wish i was that creative i'm not i just have to call it like i see it right so so here's here's basically what's happening right the group that is demonstrating doubt a i.e the muslims are calling the group that is demonstrating certainty calling us doubtful right so this this is what is known in psychology as a projection right? It's a projection on like a worldwide scale, but have no worries, y'all. We are here to be your therapists. So the first step is we're going to slap the taste right out of your mouth and give you facts about how dumb the claims are from the Islamic perspective about the life of Jesus. That's just stupid. So hopefully if there are any Muslims here, uh, I would love for you to, to come up and just have a little bit of a discussion with us. That'd be that'd be fantastic. So go ahead and get your get your uh, questions ready. Uh, we can move on to the next slide here. Thaddeus, I don't know if you wanted to say anything. No, I I think you you got it covered there. Sorry, sometimes that, I get a little excited. It, um, I, actually, I will add one thing. Yeah. Um, the the live stream that I referenced earlier, all of these hadith about who uh, was crucified in the place of Jesus or, or, or what happened, none of them make it into the reliable Hadith collections because they're not considered reliable even by <laughs> Islamic standards. <laughs> Yet, they go with this interpretation as uh, fact, mm. basically. Yeah, nobody knows, man. I mean, every, uh, for certain, they know and we don't know. We're in doubt, but I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, guys. So the devil is in the details, right? So the Quran has exactly zero falsifiable details regarding Jesus' life. I already covered this, right? The New Testament has dozens upon dozens of falsifiable details, which it gets correct, by the way. And the Quran draws, as I mentioned earlier, from second century or later Gnostic texts, none of which have verifiable details, or if they do, they're just wrong. Uh, next, next slide, if you if, if I could just throw in one example uh -huh. here. Uh, the New Testament contains, uh, or the Gospels specifically contain, I don't know the exact number, but let's say in the, in the vicinity of 50 different place names. Mm -hmm. The Gnostic texts usually only know about Jerusalem, maybe Bethlehem, and a right. couple other places. So let's say they have about five place names. Mm -hmm. How many <clears throat> uh, place names were, that Jesus visited are in the Quran? Right, actually, and that that reminds me as well. If you if you think about, um, you know, the the most common names like today, the most common names out there are Thaddeus. I mean, everybody knows that. Like, I go down the street, I meet like thirteen Thaddeuses. Right, but is certain certain time periods and, and locations have common names, right? And around the time of Jesus, all the names found in uh, in the gospel are like almost in perfect percentage alignment with people who are named who have that name um th for that time and place in in history um so even the names of people are accurate um to the to the time and place of jesus not only that the geography and, and everything else that he has said and, and this is incredibly hard to to forge if if you were trying to come up with the most popular names from a hundred years ago and you didn't have the internet to get, to go check it out or other textbooks to you know census data to go look at and figure out what mm -hmm. they were you probably would make a lot of wrong guesses and that's in your own country you know if 
if you ask me what the most popular names today are in France, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I don't Pierre. know. Pierre, it's always Pierre, dude. <laughs> I mean, you might you could probably get a couple right, but you you certainly wouldn't show the intricacy of the New Testament. And just to show how easy it is to get these wrong, uh, the Quran says that Mary's brother is named Aaron. No, oh, don't uh, go there. <laughs> I, I'm just going briefly. Oh, no, go ahead. Through. I'm messing with you. Please go. <laughs> I'm just going how it relates to name uh -huh. data. Uh -huh. uh, Muslims usually tell us that this is supposedly an honorific title or something. However, what they don't know is that there is a hadith put on Muhammad's mouth that says that, oh, you're mistaken. That's just what they just had. He just had the same name because people often use the same name. Problem is the name Aaron is unknown from the first century, hmm. as well as all the other names of the patriarchs, because it was Jewish custom not to use those names for their children. Mm, interesting. So her, she was the sister of Aaron, the daughter of Imran, um, who were both, uh, if you go back, there was a Miriam from the Old Testament, right? Who had a father named Imran and a brother named Aaron. And another brother named, I can't remember, he's a famous guy. Yeah, I think it was Muhammad. No, no, no. It's an M word, though. You're getting close. <laughs> oh, Moses. 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 <laughs> Moses. So <laughs> one of the arguments I've heard Muslims make on this is, well, it's just a reference to like the famous family member. So first and foremost, right? Uh, Aaron, right? Is, uh, what do, you, do you know what tribe he's from? Not offhand. Levi, right? Because he was yes. a priest? Yes. So the tribe of Levi. And the Messiah comes from which tribe? You tell me. The tribe of Judah. So if if Mary is somehow some descendant from Levi and that argument they make is relevant or accurate, that's fine. They still don't have the right Jesus. They think that Jesus came from the tribe of Levi when clearly he came from the tribe of Judah if he, he couldn't be the Messiah if he had come from any other tribe. So even if you grant them arguments nine times out of ten, there's still ways to overcome them. Even if you just go, oh, I'll grant that, I'll grant that, I'll grant that. Oh, by the way, did you realize that the Messiah had to be from the tribe of Judah? <gasps> oh, anyway. Yeah. Not not to belabor this point, but there's actually some early Muslim commentaries that think it is actually the same Mary. And like, people just lived hundreds of years back then. <laughs> I've never heard that. I have never heard that. That is a special, special kind of stupid right there. That is, uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I think you got a super chat, bro. Yeah, I was about to say, there before we go. go on, we have a super chat here from uh, persecuted.ct. Even they got the wrong Jesus, that character is still greater than their prophet. And right. That even, is certainly true. <laughs> even Isa, right? They're, they're Isa, who does have a lot in common with, with uh, the biblical Jesus, but in some weird ways. Uh, he was not touched by the shaitan, and neither was his mother touched by the shaitan, but the shaitan touches everyone else not a again not a genius or anything like that thaddeus i know you are a genius <laughs> was muhammad touched by the shaitan he was in fact okay was muhammad's mother touched by the shaitan presumably okay because everyone else was besides two people in the entire history <laughs> of the world jesus <laughs> and uh mother mary um, but you're right. Even their, even their pretend Jesus is way superior to their best of, uh, conduct for mankind, Muhammad. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. There, there's, we won't belabor the point, but the, if you go, you know, search on the internet for ways that Jesus is, is superior to Muhammad in Islamic texts, and you'll probably get a list of like 50 different ways that, 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 that the easy. Islamic Jesus is superior to the Islamic Muhammad. Do you mind if I tell you a, a brief story about Yahya? Sure. He's he's been he's trolled you before, right? Oh yeah. Okay, I've debated Yahya way too many times. But one of one of the debates that he himself wanted to debate. I kid you not, this was his idea. Who is superior? Jesus or Muhammad? <laughs> 
he debated me on who was better, Jesus or Muhammad. <laughs> and it was that, that's idea. especially funny because a Muslim is supposed to say that all the messengers are equal. Right. I mean, <laughs> I, I would I I literally even countered him when he when he sent me that. I was like, no, dude, like let's do like you know, Paul versus Muhammad or something. Like, you don't want to do this. He's like, Oh yeah, I do. And uh he did. Uh Villainous has solved the dilemma for us here. Mm. He said that since Mary was untouched by the shaitan, she could give birth to Jesus when she was fifteen hundred years old. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, he's found a consistency here <laughs> here in Islam after all. Right. However, you still can't answer the question of how was she a, a uh, from the tribe of Judah. Nah, we don't, need to, we don't need to worry about facts. That's not important. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Devils of the details. All right. Explanatory power. Um, so we need to, we need to take all of these things into consideration when it comes to explanatory power. Um, and I think I do. Oh, what's, what's their face? Nano, Nano. I apologize. You weren't, a, you weren't a mouse just kind of mean to you. And I didn't mean, mean to be not that I'm automatically mean to Muslims, but what you said was kind of weird. Um, anyhow, I apologize if I was overly rude to you. Um, but back, back on it. So if you have, um, if, if, if you have a atheist or, uh, agnostic or someone who knows almost nothing about Christianity, um, using kind of a little bit of what we talked about, but the hi historicity of Jesus is great. And then using explanatory power. And what that basically means is, um, how do I explain the facts of the Christian movement? What explains the facts, right? Because we, we know that the Christian movement started near Jerusalem in Judea, right? And we know that it spread rapidly, and we know this because we have writings, inscriptions, pictures, etc. Right? We know that it spread rapidly throughout the entire Roman Empire. Right? We know that it went into to Europe, Ethiopia, or not your um, uh, Egypt, Ethiopia, um, and and it was translated in all these even Germanic languages. It spread rapidly. Right? We even have. Um, stories how the christians were incredibly persecuted around 64 ad um, by the emperor nero who um set by all historical accounts set rome on fire himself and then decided he wanted to blame the christians on it right so we know that the christians had made it to rome by 60 ad and they were large enough of a movement that he could he could just be like, yeah, it was the Christian's fault, right? And he went on to persecute the Christians, and this was one of the worst per persecutions of all time. I mean, the, uh, under, under Nero, Paul and Peter um, were both executed. Um, the term Roman candles came into effect because of Christians. So what he would do is he would uh, basically put Christians in cages for his little nighttime parties. Um, and obviously they didn't have lights back then. So he would just light them on fire, right? Um, and these people, we know what they thought. We know what they believed, right? Because we have the gospels. We have the apostolic church fathers writings. Um, and, and we have that chain. I like to call it a uh, Muslims call it a chain of narration. I call it a chain of authorship. We have a chain of authorship that describes the history of the church. It describes how it grew. Right. And it's all centralized on one belief. Right. People were willing to be persecuted. They were willing um, to to proclaim these things. And they, they didn't go out with a sword. They didn't try to gather money. They didn't try to gather power or fame or any other thing that would motivate someone who's a liar to lie. They humbled themselves, they were poor, and they just went out and they said, God loves you and he loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And this is what happened to him. And as sad as that is, three days later, on the third day, he rose again. He presented himself to us. We witnessed him. We saw him. We ate with him. We touched his wounds. 
right? And we watched him ascend on the clouds back to heaven where he came from. And there's, when you really think about it, when you really think about all of the, like, why did the Christian movement spread so quickly? How did it start so peacefully? And how did it grow with this persecution of being burned at the stake, right? Roman candles, all those types of things. How did this go from this one man who was crucified and killed and resurrected to all these people? Well, the best explanatory power is found within the Gospels, right? If you're a doubter or disbeliever, you, you, you don't have to necessarily just go, oh, he walked on water. He was a virgin born. I understand those things are hard to, hard to grasp. But I want you to start with Christ crucified and Christ resurrected and then try to figure out why these people would go to such great lengths to spread the news of Jesus Christ and then reread the gospel and you'll understand why. Um, I didn't know if you had anything else to add to that, Thaddeus. That's, his, that's pretty much all I have. Yeah, I'll just make a couple quick comments. You actually undersold the spread of Christianity. There is a, what's referred to as the expulsion of the Jews from Rome in around the, the year 50. And most historians believe that this was because of all the agitation being call, caused in the Jewish community by Christians. Um, we see this uh, re referenced inadvertently in the book of Acts when we see that some people had come from Rome who are, are Christians who are testifying to the risen Jesus. Um, so not only did it spread rip rapidly, it spread so fast that there was a large enough population to be causing problems in the year 50 mm -hmm. and then re-spread by the year 62 or so uh, to again have a large enough population to blame for the fires of Rome. So you actually undersold that point, just a very minor thing there. But but your main point here is that we have a large number of facts. Um, you know, different apologists take a different approach to this. Some advocate for a minimal facts approach, so-called. Others advocate for uh, maximal facts using all the facts. But either in either approach, you have either a few key points that have to be explained they're basically on, um, so in the minimal facts case, they're, they're things that basically any historian whatsoever would accept as true. Um, things like Jesus being crucified, the church rising, the disciples of Jesus saying that they saw him alive again, and mm -hmm. perhaps the empty tomb, uh, which is pretty universally accepted, but not quite 100%. Right. Um, so you either have those minimal facts or you have all the facts, which is, you know, the the general reliability of the Gospels. When it, whenever I bring that up, an atheist will be like, "Well, just because they got place names right doesn't mean that they uh, their theology is right." But yeah, yeah, that's true. But it's a starting point, right? It's something you have mm -hmm. to explain that they knew what they were talking about. They weren't just making stuff up, and that's why the rise of the Christian Church rapidly at an early age matters. Um, numbers don't make something true, but it means you have to explain it from the original disciples believing this. It's right. not something someone made up a century later in a faraway land that just happened to take off. Mm -hmm. uh, so you either have you know, a bunch of facts or a few facts, and you have to come up with one explanation for them. Uh, no atheist can do this. They'll give you a different explanation for different facts. They'll say, well, the people thought that they saw the risen Jesus, but they were just hallucinating or mistaken, <laughs> uh, which... I mean, that's the best explanation. Mass hallucination, bro. Like three or four people at once hallucinating the same thing, dude. You just got to sometimes you just you find those mushrooms in some funny places, you know, and you're just like, come on. Like, like you have to go to like, the, yeah, some of the, some of the, um, like you said, the a a atheist theories are crazy. Just yes. Crazy. And that's the best, right? That That's much better mm -hmm. than a swoon theory or right. a twin theory or whatever other theory you're mm -hmm. going to come up with. That's the best explanation. No, it is. No, it is. <laughs> and then, you know, for the rise of Christianity, they'll just say that, 
that, well, that was because Paul was so popular and so elegant. And well, what about the conversion of Paul? Well, we don't know why Paul converted. He must have just had a psychotic episode or something. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, uh, well, what what about the the tomb being found empty? Well, they were just mistaken, or uh, they no one had bothered to look. Jesus didn't have a right. tomb in the first place. What are you talking about? Uh, right. You know, whatever. The point being that you can maybe come up with some sort of explanation for mm -hmm. any given fact, but right. the explanation's different for each fact. Mm -hmm. Or and, and that's yeah. Or Go ahead. one explanation, the truth that Jesus was resurrected. Uh, explains all the facts mm -hmm. and the fact, and this is why I started with uh, prophecies and the fact that this was prophesied, like prophesied, right? It, it's it's not as if this is some like ad hoc explanation, right? Although they could work, but at the end of the day, it's it's an explanation that takes into account the Jewish scriptures, the the prophecies of of the coming of the Messiah, of who the Messiah would be, of what they would do. Um, you know, that when you, when you take the minimal facts approach or the maximal facts approach or whatever, you also have to remember the explanatory power. And then of course the, the prophecies. And, and I just think it, look, I don't, this is my opinion. Some people might disagree with me, but it's very difficult to find something that you could just, you could just say like, you know here's a hand as I'm like a hundred percent, this is a hand, right? At, at the end of the day, you have to, you have to take all of the information on board, right? Make sure you try not to miss anything and, and take it on board and consider and pray, right? Cause if God's real, you can pray and go, God, please reveal to me the truth, uh, you know, ab about your son, son, Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy spirit, you know, uh, and take all those things on board. And then you can, you can come to a, a conclusion. Right. I mean, clearly, clearly, since I'm explaining it, that's what happened to me. That is, I'm sure your stories as an apologist, usually apologists have had some interesting walks of, of faith. Um, but it's all right there, guys. It's it's all right there. And I just want us to think about it, consider it, pray about it, see what happens. It might be uh, pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. We should, of course, compare the explanatory power of the resurrection of Jesus to the explanatory power of the Quran's teachings about Jesus. So um, what what does the Quran's <laughs> teachings oh, yeah. e explain? Um, I, I'm struggling to think of anything that they explain. Uh, well, they, they just... Maybe G that Jesus was known as a miracle worker. I suppose they could explain yeah. that. That's about it, though. The... The, basically, the entirety of the Quran, I, I believe, works from the laws of slander. And slander in, in Islam is considered offending someone, even if what you said about them was true. Right? If, if that particular person would find it to be offensive, you can't say it. That's considered slander. And especially in Islam, if you slander one of the prophets especially Muhammad or Allah, that makes you an apostate and you are to be, well, killed at some point by some particular means, right? Um, so when you read the Quran and the Hadith, you see these stories in here, especially the Quran, and none of the prophets are quite the biblical prophets, right? It's, it's, they're protecting them from anything that possibly could be embarrassing. And if there is something embarrassing, like you see some horrible thing happening to people who, who were, who embarrassed the prophet. Um, so I think that explains, they just, the criteria of embarrassment, they're the exact opposite. They change and twist every fact that might be embarrassing about someone. And they twist it into a, a, a light that, lift they well we uplift our prophets like yeah you make up stories like that's not that's not really are we looking for truth here or are we just looking like for a feel-good story like i don't really understand i don't really understand how that is a good we we uplift jesus we do not say he was crucified like i but he was like, like he's <laughs> lying he just was um yeah, I don't know. If you have anything else to add to that, please go ahead. Uh, 
it, it's not directly related, but it, it occurred to me while you were speaking. Uh-huh. So I, I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. <laughs> that if you look at the prophets in the Quran, they're kind of all exactly the same, except for Jesus. That all the prophets are basically recast versions of Muhammad. Now, you know, people trying to lead some sort of military conquest type deal. Uh, but even in the Quran, Jesus stands out as special. Jesus mm-hmm. stands out as unique. Um, he, you know, he's the the one working all these miracles. He's the right. one that is healing people. He's the one who is said to be without sin. Mm-hmm. Um, that the doctrine of prophets being perfect was developed later, but only Jesus is actually described that way in right. the Quran and in the Hadith for that matter. And he's uh, the, the Hadith said the same thing that Jesus stands alone. Uh, so even from their own texts, which are highly, highly corrupted version of history, you can see the, the uniqueness and specialness mm-hmm. of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, and he's the only one who's still alive according to them, right? He's still live. No one else is. Um, so if you want to get to, I've got a couple more slides left, I think. Um, oh. But if you want to get to. You sure do. <laughs> I sure do. I'm almost there. We're, we're working on two hours here, brother. Um, all right. So in summary, Jesus fulfills dozens upon dozens of prophecies from previous scriptures. The Bible correctly names Jesus and the term gospel whereas the Quran is ignorant in both of those things. The Bible passes the historical test, and the Quran fails miserably. Islam is Satan. And I'm not just going to say that as like a polemic. I'm going to prove it to you. So I, I began today quoting Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now let's go to Matthew 16, 13 through 23 and let's see who satan really is i'm gonna have to read from your tiny tiny screen everyone try to make this bigger there we go i can read it now i got it okay i was gonna say i can call it up and uh no you're good i got it now (laughs) um the if somebody's looking on their phone there's no way they've seen any of this but you know just listen to her voice we'll read it for you all right so we already i got it i got it oh look at you (laughs) all right so um, right. So we, we kind of already went to this, right? So Jesus asked Peter, uh, I'm going to go through the just last part of that, uh, yeah, yeah. 13. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. There we go. I was getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Okay. So Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Go and scroll down to... Yep. So from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples, this is very important, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned And he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And I said, Islam is Satan. Because Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to suffer and he will be killed. And on the third day, he will be raised again. He says it very clearly. Explicitly, we're reading it right now. Peter says, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Quran chapter 4, verse 157 says it did not happen. 
So when Peter said it wouldn't happen, Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. Anyone who denies the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Jesus would call them Satan. And Islam has it etched in its Quran. And we can say that Jesus would have called it satanic. I don't have anything to add to that. That is perfectly put. Is that's that... all I have to say. <laughs> I should probably stop sharing my screen. <laughs> you could do that. You could stop sharing it if you wanted to. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, yes, I, I I think that you know the 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 uh, picture has been painted pretty clearly here. You can except as a matter of faith that Muhammad knows everything. Uh, and it doesn't matter what the Christian texts say. It doesn't matter what the Jewish texts say. It doesn't matter what historians say. It doesn't matter what anyone says. Muhammad said it, therefore it's true. Or you can take a more objective view of things and say, if Muhammad was correct, then we should see some confirmation for his message. We should see some confirmation about what he said in Jesus. And when we look at history, when we we don't see anything. Even when we look at something as simple as Jesus's name, uh, we do not see any evidence at, that the author of the Quran knew Jesus's name. Uh, all we see is this name that has no other instance in history and certainly is not an Aramaic or Jewish name. So we can't even get the name right, and, and history doesn't testify to anything else the Quran claims. Uh, and it certainly testifies to Jesus being crucified. Kind of, I don't know. And what do you think? Which, which of those is more reliable, Muhammad's word or every fact of history? It's a tough call. It's a really tough call, Thaddeus. Um, I stayed up a lot at night and I've thought about this and I'm pretty, pretty convinced that everyone else is correct. Everybody else, every fact of history is correct. And the Quran says that uh, reproductive fluid comes from your backbone and your ribs. So, you know, it's got to be unreliable. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, if we take, even if we decide that the Quran is divine. Well, what does it tell us to do? What does it tell Christians specifically to do? I believe it tells us to oh. judge by our scriptures. Hmm. Is that not correct? So it are does. we not following the Quran better than the Muslims to throw back what they like to say about Jesus? They respecting Jesus more than we do. Mm. Are we not following the Quran better than they are by actually looking at what the Christian scriptures say? We are more Christian than Christian. We are more Christian than the Christians. Well, you know, we're, we're more Muslim than the Muslims, I guess. <laughs> All ham do to Allah, my friend. All ham do to Allah. Uh, got one question here. Not directly related to what we said, mm -hmm. but we can take a, a minute or two to answer yeah. any this question and any others that pop up. According to Islamic tradition, it mentions that there are 124,000 prophets. I will point out that that's the most common number, but there is considerable disagreement in the hadith about the exact number but you know they're they're all accurate somehow anyway uh where are all these books since we're talking about history here and you seem to know what you're talking about surely you are aware of some of these other books right mm -hmm. yeah um nope <laughs> i got nothing for you buddy i have no idea where any of these other books are i have no idea where the mentions of any of these prophets are and i don't have any idea especially if these prophets brought books and they were the words of Allah, how somehow we don't have them anymore. Allah is just, he's not, he's not good, not good at really anything, except for deception, apparently he's really good at deception, uh, but he he's not very good at preserving, preserving his word. Um, and yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but does not the Quran say that uh, Allah sends one messenger to each nation and he just hadn't gone around to sending one to the, the arabic speaking people yet and that's why he had to send muhammad yet mm -hmm. if i recall the only prophets that the 
Quran is aware of are all 100% Jewish. Yeah, pretty much. And the fact that, well, I mean, Abraham apparently built the Kaaba down there in Mecca, according to them. So was, did, he, did he not prophesy to anybody there? I guess he just went down there, set this thing up, and just like skedaddled back and said, hey, we're going to wait 2,500 years before we send you a prophet, but you're going to have this little thing that people make a hodge to all the time, uh, and it's monotheistic anyway, uh, but I'm not going to tell anybody about it, uh, although somehow everybody knew about I, it. I can't make these things up. Um, and then didn't, didn't Moses and the uh, Israelites, didn't they go down and make a little hodge to Mecca, maybe, or something? Yeah, He's not a prophet, I mean, though. He didn't. <laughs> who, who knows? Who knows? Uh, although I, I should be fair and say that since they consider Adam and, and some of the other very early figures prophets, I guess they weren't all technically Jewish. I mean, I don't think we'd say Adam was Jewish. So, yeah, technically, the Judaism, right, doesn't it comes from Israel, right, which was Jacob. So everybody before him was just like a, a father of, of Israel or something. I don't know. I, I do wonder who uh, Adam was prophesying to, though. Um, I don't know. I don't know. What one might say Eve, okay? But the Quran never mentions Eve, so yeah, all we know is he was just hanging out there by himself. For for some reason, the Quran doesn't know the name of any woman except for Mary. And no, it's a little okay. another another way that Jesus is unique. Only a, a female associated with him has a name; no one else mm -hmm. does. Yeah. This question, I think you will not be able to answer, however. Who is superior, Allah or Muhammad? You know, honestly, um, I'm going to have to go ahead and say tie because, I mean, it's like I was debating in my head, right? Because like, well, Allah's God, um, but he does everything Muhammad tells them to do. So it's like if you do everything the other person tells you to do, who's really God in this situation? You know what I mean? Or who's like, um, but Muhammad couldn't do it on his own, so he needs Allah, but Allah needs Muhammad to, I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and say Thai. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's almost as if they're indistinguishable. Maybe it's a hypostatic union or something. That Allah and Muhammad are two beings yet exactly the same. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Sock puppet. Mr. Socko. Do you remember Mr. Socko? What was the name of that guy? Did, 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 did you ever watch wrestling growing up? Oh, he's nope, a weird sorry, guy. Anyway, somebody out. somebody might know if anybody's super weird and from America and they watch W. It was WWF back then. He had a, he had a guy named Mr. Socko. Somebody, somebody please tell me. Got another question here for you, which is also extremely difficult to answer in all seriousness. Uh, Mehmet or Muhammad said a lot of including that Shaitan cast words on his tongue as Shaitan did to all the prophets of Allah. I will note, except for Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is he believable to Muslims? That's, I mean, that's genuinely a good question. Why is he believable to Muslims? Um, I think we're going to we're going to make a callback to the previous one. He's indistinguishable from Allah. And that's actually a, that's actually a really good answer. That he is a has all the attributes of Allah. So if they believe in Allah, they have to believe in Muhammad. Of course, we could also point out that most Muslims do not know their own texts. Uh, I thought, forget about the the Hadith and the Sunnah. They struggle to tell me what's in the Quran when I ask them. So, uh, you know. You can, it's it's very easy to have a emotional reaction to someone reading words that you don't know the meaning of <laughs> in a very dramatic and beautiful, if you will, way. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But it's quite another to to actually rationally know what your religion teaches and rationally accept it. And I mean, I. I'll just go ahead and make the announcement to now. I, I was going to do it at the end, but it uh, works in perfectly now. Tomorrow I have a new video out that's called The One Word That Every Muslim Fears. And the gist of it is that Muslims aren't afraid to talk about any specific topic. What they're afraid to talk about is evidence. Um, ties in well, of 
what we've been talking mm. about today. And the reason this is, is basically, if you have any doubt whatsoever about anything that's uh, theological, then you're not considered a real Muslim. So I, I'm sure that most parents don't consciously say, well, I got to make sure my kid doesn't have any doubts. But what they do is whenever a child asks a question about, you know, what, why this? Uh, uh, you know, why did Muhammad say this? Why, why did this happen to Muhammad? Whatever. It's like, don't ask questions. Just do what the imam tells you to do. Right. And because you've grown up that your whole life, then when someone asks you to give an explanation, you can't. And that, that fear comes in and you say, I'm not a scholar. you got to talk to a scholar of Islam. So that's, those are basically your two options. Either mm-hmm. you know nothing and you just blindly accept everything the imam tells you, or you have to go through all the massive education to know absolutely everything about Islam so that you supposedly won't doubt anything once you know all that knowledge. But anywhere in between, between like basically no knowledge and knowing absolutely everything, Anywhere in between, you're in big trouble because you might accidentally doubt because you have incomplete knowledge. No, no, you know I I like the idea of it, buddy, but I'm gonna have to I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna foo foo on that idea. Okay, to be a good Muslim, all you have to be able to do is deflect back to uh, the the Trinity or the divinity of Jesus, and if you can just be like it doesn't make sense, and you can say it over and over again, that makes you a great Muslim. Uh, true at least that's what we see from online comments and i actually think in all seriousness that to a lot of muslims and certainly not every muslim but to a lot of muslims what's more important to them is that non-muslims are really bad people they're really stupid Mm -hmm. Uh, they're nasty people you don't want to be part of that group so as long as you can show that christians for example uh, if you're talking to a christian have all kinds of stupid ideas you know based on your right. own complete under- right. understanding but nonetheless as long as you can say that christians believe a bunch of stupid things then that proves that you are better off being a muslim it doesn't necessarily prove it's true in their mind but it proves that it's better which is which is more important than being true right right well and and their brain brainwash from childhood right i mean the call to prayers and one of their prayers is basically they're cursing cursing christians um and their book and like yeah they, they just demonize and that's part of how cults arise is, is that's how brainwashing happens. You do repetitive behaviors over and over and over again that hardwires your, your brain. Um, you, you create emotions that are very powerful of fear of leaving, fear of being wrong. Uh, but if you, if you just isolate yourself and you don't learn anything else and you just do what we tell you to do because, uh, you know, your thoughts really aren't that good. You're kind of a fallible human. You just have to rely on us. Then you become brainwashed and you're easily in a cult. You're at, at that point, you're in a cult and um, your, your neural pathways are so formed by the time you get to adulthood that it takes a nice little slap in the face about 1300 times to kind of go, wait a minute this line of thinking is not, I'm not free thinking, right? I'm forced thinking. So um, I think it's a, I think it's a great topic, buddy. Sorry to foo-foo on it earlier. It's really good. So I don't know if this is intended as a critique against something you said or not, because it seems to be incomprehensible compared to what you actually said. But I think it is intended as as a critique of what you said. Um, so Sweeney here says there is no tribe of Judah before Moses, let alone in the beginning. Laughy face. Um, did you make a claim that the tribe of Judah goes back to the beginning of humanity? No, I mean I'm I'm trying to um, be as charitable as possible with this argument. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a I'm gonna be Mr. Muslim here for a second. Um, what this person is maybe perhaps saying. And Sweeney, please correct us if we're wrong. Um, well, they said some other things, so they're not being a Muslim, I don't think. Yeah, I didn't. So this seemed to be the first comment, and I had no idea what the ref. Yeah, maybe they're making reference to someone else. Like the only argument I can see a Muslim making in 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 regards to the tribe of Judah is like, oh, well, Jesus, 
Jesus is eternal and God, right? So the tribe of Judah had to like always exist, bro. Like that's the only argument that I can come up with that they that this could be linked to. Um, but my guess is he was just or she, whatever their pr- preferred pronouns are, um, wanted uh, was probably just making a joke or something. I don't know. Yes, yeah, they, they said not, it wasn't a critique. Okay, it was an affirmation. Okay. Oh, because we were talking. Oh, I get it now. I get it now. Do you get it now? No, you help me out here. Because I had mentioned that. Um, well, the tribe of Judah was before Moses, right? Um, because the tribe of Judah was established, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? And then Jacob's 12, 12 sons, tribe of Judah, um, and all the all the different, you know, Levi and Reuben and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so anyway, it did exist before Moses. It just didn't exist before Jacob, if we're being factual. Well... Even even if it wasn't intended as a critique, it, it does give us that opportunity to, to so so to the Muslim who would legitimately say that Jesus can't be God, he can't be the the Messiah in the sense that we are saying um, mm-hmm. that from you know Daniel seven and, and whatnot, um, because he has a beginning in time. How would we respond to that? I can't respond to that. Um, maybe I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> sorry, Clearly, I, I knew you were kidding, but man, it was it was it was just sitting there. Like maybe he's not kidding. I don't know. Um, <laughs> how do you answer that directly? Um, obviously, God is uh, incorruptible and eternal, right? Um, God. Uh, existed eternally has always existed eternally as a father son and spirit right so god has had many theophanies the angel of the lord burning bush wrestling with jacob etc etc uh entering his glory entering into the tabernacle uh, being a pillar of cloud um by day pillar fire by night etc etc like there's so many so many different examples of of theophanies and no one would ever say that he entered right he came into existence when he came into uh, time and space and the same thing is true when he comes into uh and the incarnation when he uh, adds adds to himself human human nature um there is no break in the eternity, it's a continuation of eternity just with a human nature. I don't know if you have an answer for that, Thaddeus, but uh, there you go. No, that that's an excellent answer, but uh, one that only would work on a Muslim would say, you could say, is the Quran eternal? It, presumably they'll say yes. And then you'll say, well, what about this Quran that I have here? Mm-hmm. It, it seems to have had a beginning in time. And they'll say, well, you know, that's just a... A printing of it or whatever but you can legitimately say that this is the quran when you're holding up a book i have one here but whatever (laughs) and in a normal context no one would you know have any problem with that so jesus having a beginning Mm -hmm. at, at the incarnation doesn't mean the same thing as he didn't exist before that time period so when he he takes on flesh uh, through the incarnation, through the the virgin birth, that isn't his beginning in, in the absolute sense. Right. So what you're doing is you're conflating two different meanings of beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, this printed Quran has a beginning, but that doesn't mean that the eternal Quran has a beginning. Right, like Simi- the words similarly. that are contained in it. Yeah, so the words that are contained in the in the Quran are an eternal attribute of speech from Allah, right? So the words in there are eternal. Now, it's clear that they had a beginning when they came onto the page, but the, but the, the words and the representations of them on the page are eternal from, yeah. So you, you explained it really well. Hmm. All right. I think that probably is a good place to end. We're a little over two hours. Thank you all for staying with us. I hope you got a lot out of it. And more importantly, I hope that this material helps you speak to Muslims about how, because let's be honest, generally their first response to anything you say is going to be one of two things. It's going to be the Bible is corrupted 
or the Trinity doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So obviously we didn't cover the Trinity, but we I think we covered that first one pretty good on, on how we know that the Bible is historically accurate, which you know they, they might try to change the definition of corrupted, but that's what they actually need mm -hmm. for their argument to work is for the Bible to not be historically reliable for the content to be completely changed from the historical reality. So hopefully this will help you talk to them. Um, hopefully helps you reach out to Muslims because that's what we really want to do. Um, you know, we have fun uh, making fun of silly arguments and such, but what, at the end of the day, what we really want to do is we really want to reach people. We really mm -hmm. want to reach Muslims who are lost. Um, Ask Truths said that, or compared it to a cult and the people in a cult are victims. Muslims are victims of their religion and they need rescued. It's a great perspective. Yeah. Any uh, last words that you would like to share? No, I don't think so. Just thank you everybody for watching and, and interacting with us. I know uh, if you've made it this far, you were a hero or a champion, or you're probably half asleep. Um, but at any rate, thank you guys for watching. Thaddeus, dude, thank you so much uh, for having me on. I've been a, I've been a, not very creepy admirer of you, but slightly creepy <laughs> admirer of you for the last couple of years. Um, so it's it's really honestly it's it, it's an honor to be able to converse with you and and be on share a stage with you. So thank you for having me, and like I said, thank you everybody else for bringing us on and uh, Muslims and everybody else out there. You know, just remember that Jesus truly does love you. Absolutely. Uh, keep an eye out for my new video out tomorrow, and have a great week, everyone. God bless. Yeah.